Oh God of truth, we thank you for your holy scriptures, your precepts, promises, directions, the light. In them may we learn more of Christ, indeed in the Old Testament as well as in the New. May we be enabled to retain his truth and have grace to follow it, cause us to be able to search the depths of Scripture as well as its heights. By the aid of the Spirit, may we be enabled to explore all its truths. Especially, Lord, may your Spirit cause us to love them with all our heart, embrace your truths with all our power, and graft those truths into our life. May they take deep root, be harvested at the end of time, to our joy and your praise. I ask that in this class we would gain profit by what we read, not only in our textbooks, especially in your word, as treasure beyond all treasure, a fountain which is the only thing truly that can replenish our dry hearts. So Lord, we pray that you would write your words upon our heart, Inscribe them on our lips. May we think your thoughts after you. And may all glory be to you in the reading and the interpretation of your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll get your syllabus out, please. Is there anybody uh, present here who was not here last time? Okay. Um, and you need a couple of handouts. <clears throat> Actually, I'm uh, give you three, the syllabus and, the, and two handouts. If you've not read the syllabus over, you need to read it and... Ask me any questions that you might have. Let's see. So uh, that is the syllabus. Uh, another handout is the explanation of the term paper. Another handout is an explanation of how to begin the term paper. Now, I would like everyone to look at their syllabus, please. And please turn to... Uh, Page 10 of the syllabus, please. It's very important. Next time, uh, we are going to the library. Uh, half of you uh, uh, will uh, go on a library tour for the first hour and the other half the second hour. Um, and uh, so that means really for you, your class next time is really only an hour. Um, so what I'd like to do, and if we end up, I'm going to pass a sheet around for you to sign up for the 1 to 2 or 2 to 3 for next Friday, September 20. If we get lopsided, then I'll have to uh, execute reprobation and then election, okay? So I'm passing that round. Uh, it's a very important this session because it's going to enable you to do the beginning of the assignment. Um, it's a little hard learning curve because I'm going to introduce you to some Jewish sources, primary sources, uh, that many of you likely are not familiar with. So <clears throat> be sure to read everything for next time's assignment, which is in the library. Um, it's very important that you read my chapter 6 before coming. And it's very important that you go onto Canvas and get the um, 
Jewish and Greco-Roman cultural and background uh, bibliography. I believe it's, um, it's titled Sources for Jewish and Greco-Roman Backgrounds, something like that. It, it may have a different title on can canvas, but it's the uh, uh, Jewish and Greco-Roman ba Backgrounds uh, bibliography. You need to print that out and come with it. If you don't print it out and come with it, then uh, the library tour will not be as meaningful for you. And you'll be taking notes and it, it, it'll, it'll kind of be a mess if you don't have it. So <clears throat> read my chapter six. Bring this. Crucial. Okay? And we're going to start, we're, we'll, we'll begin to work on how to uh, discover um, how early Jewish writers and later ones interpreted the Old Testament. So you'll, you'll be choosing a passage. You don't have to have chosen the passage by next time, but you need to choose your old and new passage at some point. Let's say it's the use of uh, Isaiah 54, 1 and Galatians 4. So you would, what we're going to go through, I'm going to show you how to find where Jewish commentators uh, um, interpreted Isaiah 54, 1. And uh, what you'll do, you'll find those and you'll just cite them with the proper reference. We talk, we talk, we tell you how to cite them and, um, <clears throat> and you need 10 of those references. So um, next time is to show you how do you find where Jewish commentators are citing uh, and explaining your uh, Old Testament passage. Okay? So that's for next time. It's very important. Uh, please let me know. I don't know, Dr. Briones, if you, I've, I've passed out a little uh, list for people to come to the first half of the period next time and the last half. And when you get it, would you mind bringing it down? Because I've told them if it's too lopsided, I'll, I'll have to execute reprobation and then election. So I'll have to cut some from one group and put them in another group. Okay? Okay, now. For today, we're continuing on with the introduction to use of the old and the new. Introduction to use of the old in the new. And uh, we are following this uh, outline here so we, we've uh, covered uh, direct fulfillment of prophecy indirect fulfillment of prophecy these are primary ways New Testament uses the old we've covered affirmation that are not yet fulfilled Old Testament prophecy will be assuredly fulfilled in the future we've covered analogical or illustrative uses and now we're going to look at symbolic use. And I define that in a particular way. Uh, symbolic can be defined in uh, a number of different ways. But that's what we are on now. So. Any, uh, before we get any, any questions about uh, class next time, any questions about the syllabus at this point? Um, my office hours are typically on a Thursday and uh, Friday afternoons. If you need to uh, see me, I have a sign-up sheet in that respect. It's a, a sign-up sheet of 15 minutes uh, apiece. Okay. So... Uh, symbolic use of the Old Testament then, right here. And um, here we're actually thinking of something that is already symbolic in the Old Testament. It's not something that's not symbolic from the Old and then a New Testament writer uses it symbolically. It's already symbolic uh, in the Old Testament. Thank you so much. So let's, let me just look at the list real quickly.
That's perfect. Wow. That was a good predestination. <clears throat> okay, we got everybody. Everybody remembers where, the, where they are now from one to two. We've got Osberger, Fisher, um, Showalter, you, Nicholas, somebody. What's your last name? Wok. Wok. Okay. Isaac Park, Sam Moon, Shane Wu. Uh oh. Sayong Wang. What? What's your last name? G.O.? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And guac is G-U-A-K. You need to work on your penmanship. And uh, I, I must confess that in fourth grade, I actually got uh, a prize for my penmanship. <laughs> so you must model me. <laughs> Unfortunately, my wife says I have um, degraded since then. So, and then for two to three, Lee S. Q. Miller, Walker, Matthew, Choi, and Choi. Um, Alex Sutherland, is that right? Uh, Richards and Fullerton, okay? So everybody knows what's going on. Very good. So symbolic use of old and the new. This is something already that is uh, symbolic in the Old Testament. I'd like you to turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13. <clears throat> And this is an example, chapter 13, beginning of verses 1 to 2. And he stood on the sand of the seashore. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. So if you notice the margins to uh, this passage, most Bibles um, should have for... Verse uh, 1, Daniel 7, 3, a beast coming up out of the sea. And for verse 2, should have Daniel 7, 4 through 6, where the beast was like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. And the fourth beast was more terrible than the others. It's not described as any particular animal. Um, now, already in Daniel 7, uh, those four beasts were already symbolic. They were symbolic for um, states, uh, persecuting states, government, persecuting government. And, uh, and so, um, when we come here, it's very important to go to the context of Daniel 7 uh, once you see the illusions, and you'll, you'll see those in the margin. Um, in to see what, what do they mean. And you, you'll find out they, they mean persecuting governments. And so that's probably what they mean here. The, 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 this is some creature that is a persecuting state or persecuting government. Now, we have to ask, though, why do you have four beasts combined into one? Now, that, that's a question that uh, you, you want to ask. And um, anybody have any ideas? Four beasts in the one. Kind of weird. Some would say, well, that's just, you know, John's apocalyptic, illogical use of the Old Testament. He does things like that. What do you, what do you think? Have any ideas? <clears throat> I think so, yeah. I, th I think that that is one aspect that, that likely is in mind, putting all these together to underscore the uh, uh, terror aspect of this beast in persecuting, the, the intensity of it. And there may be one other 
element here. Now we're, <clears throat> we can't be sure. Um, and so we're, we're proposing this. What we can be sure about in our interpretation is this is a persecuting government. Okay, that's the key point. But sometimes uh, you, you've got to go further. I think we have to ask why, why is this? And I think what was just said is, is a, <clears throat> a very good proposal. And another one that's not inconsistent with that, perhaps supplementary to it, is these beasts uh, represent kingdoms that occurred over hundreds of years. So maybe also there's a trans-temporal element to the beast as well. Um, <clears throat> not just some beast for the first century, not just a beast for the future and a future tribulation, a, a trans-temporal beast. Um, because we know that this beast was alive and well in the first century. Notice verse 3, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And um, verse 12 also talks about his head uh, having been slain. The likelihood is he was slain by Jesus Christ at the cross and his resurrection. So the likelihood is here that the beast has his uh, beginning existence in the first century, but that's not all. He, he, he uh, probably transcends time. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the symbolic use is really pre pretty much a subcategory of, of analogy. And remember, the point of an analogy is uh, you're dealing with a word or a phrase uh, that uh, has expresses principles. And so you're trying to see what's the principle of continuity in the analogy. And so what's the principle of continuity here? The principle of continuity in the passage we just looked at is the idea of a persecuting state. Okay, it's not the exact same states as in Daniel 7, but it's a persecuting state. Now, our, our other two suggestions are very, uh, I think, I, I would put it this way, very plausible, uh, but, but, but they're not as certain as uh, the fact that these are persecuting states. But they, this is a subcategory then of analogy. You, you carry over the, uh, the, the idea of the Old Testament into the New Testament. Um, so now let's look at uh, the abiding authority of the Old Testament. Um, what, what you'll find here is a little bit. <clears throat> um, you have the phrase, it is written. For example, turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 3. So I want to, you know, put some flesh on each of these uses. Romans chapter 3. Verse 4, may it never be. Paul has said, uh, uh, if some do not believe, uh, will their unbelief nullify, uh, or will not their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? He says, may it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you might be justified in your words and might, prev be, and might prevail when you are judged. Now that is from Psalm 51 and verse 4. And um, uh, this is just saying that what was valid at the time of David as he uh, wrote this psalm, uh, what was valid about God is still true. It is an idea that has abiding authority, not only in the Old, but on into the New Testament. Now you want to go back and you, you want to see what does that verse really mean in its context. Uh, you'd want to go further in interpreting it. But at least uh, we, can, we can say that. Likewise, you remember last time that our passage uh, illustrating one of the analogical uses of the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 25 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you'll not muzzle the ox while he's threshing. That also is introduced with, for it is written. It's, a, it's an abiding truth, uh, an abiding authority that carries over. It's true in the Old, it's true in the New. And what this really shows is you, you can have sometimes two or three uses overlapping validly with one another. So we, 
we, we have the idea of, uh, uh, of an abiding truth that continues, and it's, it's also an analogy. Um, <clears throat> likewise, 1 Timothy 5.18, you can write that down. Uh, that is uh, really pretty identical to this passage. It's also about the uh, do not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, introduced with kathos uh, gegraptai, as it is written. Now, the next use, uh, the proverbial use of the Old Testament, and uh, I feel like I'm blocking this in, in one way or another. Just see here. Maybe I can just move over a little bit. Can everybody see that pretty well? Okay. Um, this, this next use, then, is uh, the proverbial use of the Old Testament. And we can also call that the stock and trade use of the Old Testament. Why would we call it stock and trade? Uh, well, you know, if you go to a hardware store, their stock in trade is nails and screws and hammers, etc. They just have a lot of it. That's what they commonly have in stock, and that's what they sell. So they, that, that's their stock, and they trade. That is, they sell it. So stock and trade is, is, is something that there's a lot of it. And so when you find something in Scripture that there is a lot of reference to it, well, that might be a good candidate for a proverbial or a stock and trade use of the Old Testament. Let me give you an example. When uh, someone says, Let's say, you know, your favorite football team was uh, perfect until the playoffs, and then they lost to a team that they were expected to beat. Uh, and, and you say, well, that was their Waterloo. Um, probably a number of people, when they hear that, don't think of Napoleon's loss at Waterloo to the English. They, it's used so much in, in English uh, usage that we've come to identify it with a decisive defeat sometimes a surprisingly decisive defeat. It's become proverbial in that way, okay? This is your Waterloo. It's like a proverb. Um, and so, uh, but if you appreciate its original, how it, where, where it originally came from, it'll help you appreciate it all the more you, if you understand the original context. But you can still get some of it because it's become a pro proverbial use. Or if we say uh, Afghanistan is America's uh, Vietnam, now, uh, many of you weren't alive when uh, Vietnam was going on. Um, and uh, some of you may not know a lot about Vietnam. Um, but maybe you've heard, uh, oh, you know, at other times in the United States government's recent history, uh, when, when you have been alive, that uh, some kind of foreign involvement that we've had, involvement in another country, and it's not going well, uh, some said, oh, here's America's Vietnam. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a war that is not going to be won. And we're just going to get bogged down. It becomes proverbial. Or if someone, if someone says, uh, well, this is your water gate, and now they've made it into all kinds of gates. Uh, you know, whether, whether it's, you, you know, um, you, I, I, I hear this all the time. Uh, uh, Watergate uh, becomes transformed into other kind of gates. But if one, someone says, oh, this is uh, Joe Biden's Watergate, well, what does that mean? It means he's covered something up that's, uh, that's a crime. And, uh, is, and it's been used so much, that's what it means. But really, if you go back to its original meaning, it was uh, uh, some people who worked for Nixon uh, that... Uh, uh, did something, uh, they, did, they committed a theft, and uh, Nixon covered it up. But it's proverbial. This is their Watergate. Uh, so um, let me give you an example in Scripture. In the Old Testament, the phrase Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon uh, is just used all throughout the Old Testament. About 11 times, they are an enemy of Israel. But by the time of 1st Maccabees, which is 2nd century B.C., and Jubilees, now these are books that are not in the Bible, 
Now, Jubilees is in the Ethiopic canon. That's interesting, uh, which is intriguingly still open. Really uh, very interesting. I met a missionary studying the Ethiopic canon because it's still open, and uh, they're, uh, they're still debating certain books in their canon. Um, but in, in, in those two books, uh, the same phrase, uh, Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon is mentioned, even in later Jewish writings uh, as well in the Midrash Rabbah. Um, but by the time it's used, probably in the second century, in First Maccabees and Jubilees, it, it, it cannot be referring to the literal nations of Edom, uh, Moab, and the sons of Adam, because it, in the second century they disappeared. So that in Qumran, whose writings begin roughly, probably around 130, 140 B.C., Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon are mentioned, and the, it just becomes proverbial for the enemy of Israel, because those nations don't exist anymore at the time of Qumran. So um, that's a good example. Um, sometimes, for example, uh, that phrase, usually in Qumran, is applied to the Romans. Very interesting. Um, because that was the typical proverbial name for Israel's enemy. Now, there, there's a word in the New Testament that's used a lot. Um, let, me, let me show you that. It's the word mysterion, mystery. And uh, you can see how much it's used. Quite a lot. And um, it was used a lot in Qumran as well. Quite a bit. Uh, and if you read these, and if you go to Qumran as well and read their writings, it has to do with an eschatological mystery. Something being fulfilled that was not so clear in the Old Testament, or perhaps not clear at all. And so, this is used so much when the, when the word mystery occurs, it's just kind of proverbial for an eschatological fulfillment of prophecy that's unexpected. Um, now, its origin is in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Sorry, that's the same one. Let's see, here we go. And in Daniel, and, and just to explain to you, there are two Septuagints in Daniel. There's what we now call the Old Greek that's listed as LXX here, and there's what we call Theodotion. So, uh, uh, these are pretty repetitive of these here. But you can see that already in Daniel, mystery is being used. And what's this being used for? For example, to the king, uh, Daniel says, there's a God in heaven revealing mysteries. Uh, God is the one revealing mysteries, and he has shown to you, Nebuchadnezzar, what must come to pass. Well, what's the mystery there? The mystery is that a stone's cut out without hands and strikes the statue that represents the four kingdoms, and um, which is the enemy of Israel. It's an eschatological destruction. And I suspect that when that was explained to Nebuchadnezzar, that that was surprising to him. So it's, a, it's an eschatological uh, uh, mystery that when the fulfillment occurs, it's going to be a little surprising. When he was told how it would be fulfilled, he was surprised. In Daniel 4, likewise, there's a prophecy only about him. Now he's going to be cut down like a tree. And uh, he was quite shocked about that. Uh, and it's called a mystery. Uh, Daniel says, here's the mystery. And so, um, now that, that wasn't uh, specifically about esch eschatology there, but it's about one of the, uh, the, the falls of one of the kings. By the way, uh, it's just struck me that, uh, you know, how all of those kingdoms were piled into one. Um, well, that already has precedent in Daniel. Uh, because in Daniel 2, it says all of the kingdoms are struck at once. Very interesting. And likewise, it talks about the judgment of the four kingdoms later in Daniel 7, and they're defeated at once. How do you defeat four kingdoms at once? Very interesting. How do you do that? 
probably the fourth kingdom, the last eschatological kingdom, is the head, the representative, corporately uh, in solidarity with the other kingdoms. That's probably how they could be all destroyed together. So, so we do have a little precedent, very intriguingly. We're probably uh, uh, right that um, John puts those together in some way. In Daniel, they're put together to emphasize a corporate judgment. Uh, in Revelation, they're put together, I think, to emphasize their horrific persecuting activities. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, there, there's another possible uh, use here uh, that we could mention that falls under the proverbial use, and that is there's an apocalyptic visionary pattern in uh, the prophets, especially Daniel, sometimes Ezekiel and Zechariah. It's in Revelation, and it's this. Behold, I saw, and I fell down trembling, an angel lifted me up. He made known the interpretation to me. And then you find that just all over Jewish apocalyptic visions uh, from the 2nd century B.C. on into the 2nd century A.D. That may be stock and trade apocalyptic language. Now, it could fall in, under another use as well, as we'll see. Um, now, let's uh, look at another use, the um, rhetorical use of the Old Testament. Rhetorical use. Right here, number eight. And again, uh, I'm not going over these uses um, just for my own benefit. You're going to be basically bombarding your passage. You're going to be asking, is this a rhetorical use? Is this a symbolic use? Is, is this a proverbial use? Is this an indirect typological use, etc.? So you've got to become familiar with these uses. In fact, everything I'm lecturing on for the, uh, in, in the introduction here, in one way or another, I'm trying to distill what's in my handbook for you and, uh, because that is absolutely crucial for the assignment. So the next one then is uh, rhetorical use. Uh, we could call that the embellishment use. Uh, it, it is language expressed with a view only to being uh, impressive or persuasive in effect. It does not primarily give information, primarily. Um, some say that Romans 10, 6 to 7 is a rhetorical use of the Old Testament. Paul's not concerned about the context of the Old Testament at all here. He's just using it in a flowery way, sort of like an Israelite politician would uh, uh, perhaps maybe speaking to a particular very conservative group of uh, Jewish people uh, in Israel or in the States, and the Israeli, Israeli politician decides, well, I'm going to sprinkle my my speech with all these Old Testament allusions and he just picks and chooses. He's not concerned about what they really meant. He just wants these people to know, hey, I'm Old Testamentish and uh, like you. And so that, that's the idea. And uh, just to kind of flower it up, to impress them that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a good old uh, Jewish Joe like you that I appreciate my Old Testament. Um, so I, I believe, by the way, uh, that this is a very rare use in the New Testament, uh, but some think it's a very prevalent use. Some who are influenced by postmodernism, like a guy by the name of Christopher Stanley, um, says that uh, he thinks Paul often appeals to the Old Testament, in the quotations especially, to say, Look, I know what I'm talking about. I have the authority. You just listen to me. So it's a power move. It's just a way to say, I'm the key guy here. I know the Old Testament. You don't. You recently converted Gentiles. And so I'm the authority figure. That's what Stanley says. Now, I do believe that every use of the Old Testament is rhetorical, but in a different way than this rhetorical use is defined. And that is, of course, whenever an allusion or a quotation is used, the biblical writer is trying to persuade people to, to one thing or another, to some right action or some right belief. Of course. But, in my view, once you understand the context and the content of the Old Testament and how that's carried over, it just fuels uh, the persuasion 
that the author is trying to uh, bring about. So that's a little different. Understand that rhetoric is used in different ways then. It always means persuasive. But in this debate in Old and New, sometimes it means trying to be persuasive and not caring at all about what the Old Testament says, just to pump you up as an authority figure. And, um, and for those of you who have done much work in postmodernism, you'll um, uh, appreciate where that's coming from. Uh, so I do think that there are rhetorical uses, but I think they're uses that really pay attention to the Old Testament that then fuel and support the uh, <clears throat> persuasiveness the author wants to bring about. Next one, we'll call it the Midrashic um, Blueprint or Prototype Use. Um, here I only have Blueprint or Prototype. I'll explain why I say uh, mid Midrashic in a moment. Um, <clears throat> here the idea is this. An author has one Old Testament context in mind in a New Testament chapter, and it forms the structure for the chapter. And then the author will allude to other Old Testament passages outside of that Old Testament model to bring them in to interpret, to amplify uh, that one Old Testament uh, segment that he has in mind. And uh, what, what causes him? What is the rationale for why he brings in other allusions into that one Old Testament model? Well, sometimes it is a phrase, a common phrase, a common theme, a common picture. Um, let me give you some examples. Let me put some flesh on this particular use. As you find it, you find it in Judaism as well as in the New Testament. And why, why would that be? I don't think the New Testament is borrowing their methods from Judaism. Um, I think they're both borrowing their methods from another common source, which is the Old Testament. Uh, all of these uses we're talking about, really, you find later Old Testament authors using earlier New Testament texts, and a lot of the uses uh, that I've been talking about are Old in the old uses, not just old, in the new uses. So here's a, let's see, it's not coming out too good. Have to move that over. And let me make that a little bigger. Okay, this, this uh, 1QM is uh, uh, an abbreviation, uh, that's um, uh, K1 in Qumran, M stands for Milkama, which is war. This is from their war scroll, and they believe they were going to fight a war, and this is their plan to fight the war, very interesting. And the way they're planning to fight the war, or the way they foresee that war is going to go, what do they do? They go to the Bible. They go to places where it talks about an eschatological war. And they begin doing biblical theology. And they put all these things together. So these people do biblical theology. Notice this, it says, after this war they'll go up fence against all the troops of the Katim. These are the good guys here. The Katim are the Romans in Egypt. And in his appointed time he'll go forth with great wrath to fight against the kings of the north. And his anger shall be uh, such as to destroy utterly and to cut off the horn of Belial. So this person who's going to cut off the horn of Belial is God himself, uh, uh, conducting war on behalf of the Jewish Qumra, Qumranites. And, um, and it goes on and talks about this. Uh, this will be salvation for the time. This will be, uh, it'll be the time of salvation. For all the men of his lot and the final destruction for all the lot of Belial. And um, pull that up. Yeah. And 
And so um, it goes on. This will be the hour of dominion for all the men of God's lot and the final destruction for all the lot of Belial, etc. Now, the key thing here, though, is to look. Uh, all of this is out of Daniel 11 and 12. And um, so the, the, I've categorized the illusions from clear to probable. In other words, certain, probable, and just possible. But notice, uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but just notice where all the illusions are coming from. Daniel 11, and as you proceed on, um, you, you continue to see Daniel 11, and if we were to go on, you would find Daniel 12. So he's got in his mind this final battle described in Daniel chapter 11 and, uh, uh, and, and, in, uh, and the victory in chapter 12. And notice that we do have other passages here. Isaiah 49, 8, Zechariah 14, um, <clears throat> Isaiah 31, uh, Genesis 10, 2 Chronicles 1. These texts are brought in because they have some sort of similar phrase or theme. And it, 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 this is what we call midrash. The basic definition of a Jewish midrash is interpreting Scripture by Scripture. So he's taking Daniel 11 and 12. He's using it as a model for this last battle. And yet he's uh, uh, interpreting it by some of these other passages uh, from the Old Testament. So, is that door closed? Could you close that door for me? Thank you. Um, so that would be a good example. Daniel 11 and 12 is a prototype. It is a model that he is using. And this does, uh, does occur quite a bit. For example, in the New Testament. If you go to Revelation uh, 4 and 5, the outline of Revelation 4 and 5 is the outline of Daniel 7. There's an introductory vision, phraseology, the setting of a throne in heaven, God sitting on it, description of God. Uh, there's fire before the throne, heavenly servants surrounding the throne, a book before the throne, and the opening of the books, the approach of a divine messianic figure, the Lamb, to receive authority. And uh, that outline... It, it continues. Uh, there's a kingdom that includes all peoples, nations, and tongues. That's an actual phrase from Daniel 7, 14. And, um, and then there is, uh, here you can't see it real well, but uh, John, as a seer, has distress on account of the vision. And then he gets heavenly counsel and, uh, fr from uh, an angel. And, um, and this continues on. That's just about the end of it. There, but there is uh, one thing. Well, it does say at the very end, the saints are given divine authority to reign over a kingdom. And there's also a sea there. Remember, there's a, a, a crystal sea right before the throne in chapter 4. And that may not be accidental because there is a sea in Daniel 7 from which these beasts arise. Um, so, first of all, um, John is concerned to explain the death and resurrection of Christ as through the model of Daniel 7. The Lamb is none other than the Son of Man, since this is model in Daniel 7. And Christ's death and resurrection is the way that the Son of Man comes to rule. Um, that's the interpretative significance of this model. And we could ask, how about the sea? Well, since in Revelation 4, it's a crystal sea, it's completely, perfectly calm like glass, uh, and yet in Daniel, it's just blown by the four winds, it's a very, very, very choppy, stormy sea, and the beasts rise up out of it, um, it may be that it's Christ's death and resurrection that uh, he, he goes down in death, conquers uh, the king of death, the uh, sea serpent, and rises again from the dead so that the seas are calm. That may be the significance of the sea. I think it's more than coincidental 
that you've got like 13 outline elements here of Daniel 7 uh, imposed, uh, superimposed on Revelation 4 and 5, and, uh, and then you have the element of the sea. It probably connects in some way, and I think perhaps in the way that I just mentioned. Now, just to show you what uh, John does here, he... Um, He includes other allusions. Notice in verse 8, the holy, 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 that's from Isaiah 6, 3. And the, uh, the living creatures, remember that's uh, Ezekiel 1, 10. Um, and Daniel 4, 34, which says that God is the one who lives forever and ever. And so on. And so other passages are brought in here. Why? That's a theophany. Daniel 7, and the vision there. Is God appearing, the Son of Man coming before God? Ezekiel 1 is a theophany um, where God is appearing again and his angels. And of course, why Daniel 4? Because it's not too far away from Daniel 7. So there are different reasons for why these are brought in. This is the epitome of, of a theophany in heaven, an appearance of God. And so, um, as my wife says, so what difference does the Daniel 7 model mean? Sometimes I get so caught up in just showing something as a model and not explaining its significance. Uh, so what is? John uses Daniel 7 to show that Jesus' death and resurrection is the fulfillment of the Son of Man prophecy there. Now, sometimes you don't have an outline. You just have a clustering, uh, a saturation of illusions so that in uh, Revelation 13, 5 to uh, 6... You just have a saturation. We just read it. Right? Remember, we, re we read the beginning of that, the beast that was like a bear, a lion, uh, and a leopard. Um, his mouth speaking. All these are from Daniel 7. Authority was given to him. He opened his mouth in blasphemies. Uh, it was given to him to make war with the saints. All of this is, is from Daniel 7. It's just saturated with Daniel 7, most of this chapter. So, obviously, his mind's in Daniel 7. Uh, he is explaining... Uh, uh, th th this uh, end time enemies assault on God's people through the lens of Daniel 7. So you go back to Daniel 7 to see what was going on there. And so now uh, John is further talking about that. The question is, is this about the future or is it about the present? That's something I'm not going to talk about now. I do think, however, it's probably already and not yet. Many commentators think it is only future. That's something we're not going to get into now. I'm just trying to talk about the use. Um, so there are a number of uh, uses here. Um, you can have a use that's a, a thematic framework, not based on a chapter, but on a theme. So, for example, if you look at Romans 9 through 11, here's a little chart of Romans 9 through 11. And by the way, you'll find most of these charts in my handbook. So you'll see that here where you have the checks, all of those checks represent passages that have to do with the restoration of Israel. The dashes show that while the verse is not directly about the restoration of Israel, it is in the context. And then I've, you know, when you find a little uh, zero there, that means it's not there at all. For the most part, everything in Romans 9 through 11 is for, are from Old Testament context about the restoration of Israel. And, um, and very intriguingly, it's very clear that they're already and not yet. Um, it's not, there, it's not the, the, the restoration of Israel is not just future. For example, in chapter 9 and in verse uh, 24, he talks about how God has had mercy uh, <clears throat> on vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us Jews, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, however, but also from among Gentiles, as he says also in Hosea, I'll call those who were not my people my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved, and it shall be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God, that is not just future. That is inaugurated. The and that's a restoration prophecy from Hosea. 
So this is, this, uh, Romans 9 through 11 is about the already and the not yet of uh, the prophecies of restoration. Of course, it's a very debatable topic because a dispensationalist and some progressive dispensationalists think that Israel will only be restored in uh, a, a future time, which is uh, ultimately in the millennium. And um, so, you know, you would have to decide how do you deal with these passages? Because uh, a dispensationalist, even a progressive dispensationalist, would not say that just because Hosea is seen as applied to Gentiles, they do not believe it's fulfilled in Gentiles. They think what I just read is an analogical use of Scripture, not direct fulfillment of Scripture. And it is introduced with, as he says in Hosea, I wish it had fulfillment in it. Um, it would be clearer. But everything here is fulfillment. For example, uh, he says in verse 27, as Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Well, he's saying at present there's only a remnant of Israel. And that is a fulfillment of prophecy. And he doesn't introduce it with a fulfillment formula. And sometimes he does. Verse 29 says, just as Isaiah foretold, except the Lord of Sabbath had left to us a prosperity, we uh, would have become as Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. So uh, you, you have these uh, quotations. You don't have to have a fulfillment uh, introductory clause to show it's a fulfillment. It's apparent from the context. Um, so uh, this is a good example here. Uh, in, in Hosea, right, right here, the verses 25 and 26 of an already and not yet, and it may be, since that's the major theme, the already and the not yet, and most of these, the vast part uh, of these are already. In fact, almost all of them, you, you look through them, they're beginning fulfillment. And that may tip the scale for us when we come to that very debatable passage in other words, this is uh, the help of the model uh, where in verse 26, thus all Israel will be saved. Um, is that exclusively future? Uh, I think it's already and not yet. Not just future. It is future, but it's, it's beginning to happen. The remnant of Israel is being called out and being saved now, and that will be consummated in the future I think that for a number of reasons. I've just been asked uh, by my former colleague, uh, uh, Douglas Moo, to, uh, he has a, a Romans uh, section in the Evangelical Theological Society, and next, uh, not this year, but next year they're doing Romans 9 through 11. So he and I have debated that text, uh, that, that, that passage, including the specific verse 26, and so it's probably why he asked me to do it. We, we disagree about it. Um, that's probably why he got me. It's boring for everyone to agree. So um, <clears throat> that's a very, very, he, t he sees it as future. I see it as already and not yet. One reason I do, by the way, I can't resist saying, um, is when you get the phrase sothesitai in Old Testament quotations, in Romans 9 through 11, they are already and not yet. So, for example, notice... Um, Verse 27 of Romans 9 that I read, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Now that is cast in the future tense, as it was in the Old Testament. But he's plopping it into a fulfillment framework. So you can have future tense, which clearly is being fulfilled. The author's just quoting it as it was in the Old Testament. Um, and so likewise, Romans 10 and verse 13, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, so face the There it is again. That's from Joel. And of course, that's inaugurated. So um, I think because of the heavy emphasis on inauguration here in this model, uh, that it's very consistent that verse 26 would also be already in not yet. Um, there are some... Other examples here, I'll give you one example. Um, so, so this is a very interesting, uh, this I also call this the framework use. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it X, Y, and Z, whatever. 
but um, I, I call it Midrashic framework, prototype, or blueprint. But here is the book of Galatians. problems here navigating this. There we go. Okay. Now, th th this is from a dissertation done at Wheaton, and what this guy argues is that Isaiah 40 to 66 is the broad model for the book of Galatians. And what's Isaiah 40 to 66 about? It is about already and not yet restoration. Uh, and so you'll notice he's, uh, when he says A here, he means illusion. Uh, e means an echo, TP means a theme. Uh, there's really only one citation, which is Isaiah 54, 1 in Galatians 4, but um, I don't agree with every one of his allusions, but he may be on to something here, uh, that all of Galatians is, uh, Paul's mind is in uh, Isaiah 40 to 66. Now, Let's look at another use. Any, any questions about that use? It's a very important use. Yes? So, I've always heard Isaiah being kind of like a, a, step, like a subset of the whole Bible. The six chapters of the book of the And 40 to 66 is then the New Testament. Is, is the guy proposing an interpretation that Galatians is almost like a summary of the New Testament throughout that it starts with Matthew and Revelation? No. No? No, he wouldn't say that. And I doubt he would say that about Isaiah 40 to 66. So, <clears throat> all right. Let's look at the, um, the textual use of the Old Testament. Textual use. What do I mean by that? Well, you've, you've got uh, the Greek Old Testament. In fact, you've got different Greek Old Testaments. Okay? There's not just one Greek Old Testament. Just like, you know, at the bottom of your New Testament text, you have all these textual variants. Those are different Greek Bibles. Those, those represent different Greek Bibles. And so also, there were different Greek Old Testaments uh, that had different uh, uh, variants and readings in them. And sometimes a New Testament writer might uh, allude or quote uh, a version of, uh, of the Greek Old Testament, might quote the Aramaic Targum, uh, for those that, that were early, some of the Targums were later. Um, so let me give you an example where this occurs. Uh, in, um, in, in Revelation 17, we have um, the statement here. Again, the beast from Daniel 7 is uh, conducting uh, war on Christ and the saints. And it says, these, the beasts, plural, these will make a war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because Lord of lords he is and king of kings. Now, that language cannot be found in the Hebrew Old Testament. You find God of gods and, and Lord of lords, but you don't find... King of kings and, and, and Lord of lords, or vice versa. Except in the Old Greek of Daniel. And the Old Greek of Daniel uh, has this. And this is really weird, too, by the way. Uh, in the Aramaic canonical text and in Theodotion, which is one version of the Greek of Daniel, there's just one sentence for verse 37. It's very, very brief. However, here, I want you to see that verse, uh, verse 37 has already begun way up there. And here's verse 37a, verse 37b. That's quite an expansion. That's quite a living Bible at that point. Uh, that's huge. Usually you don't have that big of an expansion of a verse uh, in the LXX, but in this case, it is different, but what we find is, whereas in all uh, the Aramaic canon and in Theodotion 
Uh, it talks about Nebuchadnezzar praising God after he's been humbled as a beast and come out from under that uh, judgment. Uh, here we find, I confess and praise that he is God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings, uh, etc. It goes on and describes God. And so what we have here then is Jesus, uh, John takes that phrase and, um, and he, applies it, he applies it to Christ, which is amazing. That's a huge statement about the deity of Christ. Uh, Christ is identified with uh, the God of Daniel 7. So that, that would be the significance of that particular textual use of the Old Testament. It can be very significant. Um, another use. You may remember in the book of Revelation, um, we have this phrase here. For Christ says, he's the Amen, the faithful and true witness. And, um, and it goes on to say, he's the beginning of the creation of God. Now, this is probably an allusion to Isaiah 65, 16, where there it says twice, the God of Amen, the God of Amen. Um, and that John is likely alluding, well, not John, right? this is Christ now, right? He's speaking. That Christ is making a reference back to Isaiah is apparent since the only place in all of the Old Testament where Amen is a name is right here in Isaiah. Everywhere else it's like Amen, like the way we use Amen in one way or another. Um, and furthermore, the translation, you can translate Amen as faithful and true. Jesus may be expanding it in that way. And that he is likely expanding it in that way and possibly showing further that he's alluding to Isaiah uh, uh, 65 is the fact that in Isaiah 65, some Greek Bibles transliterate the, the Amen as Amen, but others uh, translate it as faithful and uh, others translate it as true. Um, so you can see uh, here, some use alethanos instead of amen, and some use forms of pisteo as faithful instead of amen. So you got you know, three different <laughs> Greek Old Testaments at this point. Jesus may be combining them together, or he may be doing just what they were doing seeing that amen can be expanded as faithful and true. It's an amazing statement, by the way, because it shows that this was Yahweh. And now again, Jesus is identified as Yahweh. When the Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, old and the new is a great thing to do with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, again and again, Christ is identified with Yahweh of the Old Testament. And what confirms that this is an allusion to Isaiah 65, 16. Is it Isaiah 65, 17? God says, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. And here in Revelation, the statement concludes with, I'm the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus not only identifies himself with Yahweh, but he's also the beginning of the new creation in his resurrection. So these are amazing uses uh, of the Old Testament. Um, there's another one that's, uh, let me see how well I can put this up. If I can't get this up real, this doesn't show real well, I'm not going to use it. Let's see. Okay. Well, we'll look at it briefly. In Revelation chapter 2, and in uh, uh, verse 29, you, you have this uh, statement. This is another example of the textual use of the Old Testament. And Jesus says in verse 26, the one overcoming and keeping until, keeping my works 
until the end. I will give to him authority over the nations, and he will shepherd them with a rod of iron as the potter's vessels are smashed or broken to pieces um, or shattered. Now, that passage is um, a quotation from Psalm 2, verses 8 through 9. He'll shepherd them with a rod of iron. Um, and that's, in fact, what the, uh, the Greek Old Testament has also in Psalm 2.9. Uh, it has shepherd. You can see over here that we also have shepherd. Here's the problem. Psalm 2 has break. And uh, break is from the Hebrew verb ra'ah. Everybody's, well, how many have not had Hebrew? Raise your hand. Uh, everybody, okay, good. How many are just in the first, well, raise your hand if you hadn't had Hebrew. No Hebrew? Raise your hand. No, okay. At least you've begun Hebrew, right? Okay. You know the alphabet. You know some words. All right. Very good. Very good. So this is from uh, ra'ah, which means to smite. That's what the psalm has. So you will break them, smite them with a rod of iron. Here, the Greek Old Testament has shepherd, and in Greek, it's very, I mean, in Hebrew, it's very similar. It's tear aim, shepherd them. This is tetro aim. And in the Hebrew, without pointing, look at that. Looks exactly the same. Exactly the same. So which is it? Well, the Masoretes said, it's tero aim. They came and put the pointing in. That's not fail safe. That's a world tradition. Um, GB Caird and others say this is one of the howlers where uh, clearly the Septuagint misread the Hebrew, didn't, know, didn't get the vowel, vowel pointing very well, and uh, they translated it shepherd. John mindlessly copies the Septuagint. He's just, you know, um, making the same mistake the Septuagint did. Are there any other alternatives here? Well, there is another alternative. And that alternative is this could be the original reading. Again and again, you'll learn in Hebrew that the Septuagint, uh, not untypically, there, there are significant times that it actually has the original reading. In fact, this is a hapax legomenon grammatical form here. It's the only time it occurs. Uh, so, right, right here in, in the, the, he, the Hebrew. Uh, and so, um, this, may, this may represent the original. Um, another option would be, because remember Jesus says, he quotes this, applies it to the believer, and says, as I have received authority. So he's applying this to himself in an inaugurated way, right? Because he says, as I have received authority, so may they have it. Perhaps only in the future for them, but now for me. And um, it may be this is an ironic use of the Old Testament. The Messiah will come and smite through his death and resurrection, but that same death and resurrection will shepherd his people. It's a possible understanding of it. Probably the best understanding, however, is that in chapter 19 and in verse 7, uh, what is it, verse 15 here, uh, it reads this way. I'm going to read it to you. It says, and from Jesus' mouth... Uh, proceeds a sharp two-edged sword in order that he should smite the nations and he himself will shepherd them with a rod of iron. Their shepherd is in parallelism with smite. It's a judgmental term. It's not just a positive term. It's judgmental. And in fact, if you go to the Septuagint, you, you will find that sometimes poimano and its Hebrew equivalent Ra'ah are judgmental terms. For example, 
uh, Micah 5.5, 5, Jeremiah 6.23, and Jeremiah 22.22. 22. So you, you can find in the Septuagint and in the Hebrew that sometimes ra'ah or poimano is a judgmental term. So uh, why would uh, John use here, why would Jesus, remember this is Jesus, not just John. Why would Jesus use um, shepherd instead of the smite? What's synonymous? Probably just a judgmental term. Um, he may have been motivated to do it, however, because of the similarity of the words here. He might have been motivated to say, well, you know, I'll use a synonym here. Um, I'm a little bit attracted to the ironic use. Maybe that's because I'm just publishing a book that's coming out right now on irony. But um, at any rate, okay. That's the textual use of the Old Testament. One more, one more example. Turn to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. Verse 4. Revelation 1, 4. It says this. It's best if you have your Greek Bibles, by the way, and I'll translate for you. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from the one who is and the one who was and the one who is coming and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. But notice, notice it says there, you see that where it says grace and peace, apa, ha, on, does everybody see that? What were you taught in Greek about what has to follow the preposition apa? Anybody remember that? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a little syntax test here. Genitive. You've got to have a genitive. Why? Because our father says so. The Greek father. So, um, no genitive. But a scribe decided to be the teacher and correct John. And notice what the scribe has in verse 4 in your apparatus. See that? Theu. See the genitive? So that he has uh, from God, from Theu, and then Ha'on. Oh, it's okay to use a relative in the nominative, you know, to refer back to uh, a genitive at that point. So, so the scribe corrects it, and in so doing, the scribe clouds the text. How so? Look in the margin. What does the margin say? It says Exodus 3.14. And in Exodus 3.14, it talks about in the Septuagint, remember, Moses says, whom shall I say is sending me? In the Septuagint, God says, ha'on, ha'on, twice. What John is doing, even though he should be using a genitive here, he keeps it in its original nominative form so that the, as a signal to the reader, because to the reader, this is reading it or hearing it, it's like fingernails on a syntactical chalkboard. So it makes you go, and perhaps it's a way for him to refer back, hey, this is right out of the Septuagint. I'm keeping it in its same nominal form, uh, uh, even though... Um, I'm not uh, writing proper Greek. There's a reason I'm not writing proper Greek. I want you to recognize the illusion. And by the way, if you look, there's another reference there in the margin, Isaiah 41, 4. And Isaiah 41, 4 gives three names for God in alluding to Exodus 3, 14. So he's probably alluding to both. So Isaiah 41, 4 says, now that... Uh, I think the allusions to the Septuagint, but we'll see what the Hebrew says. He says, I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am He. So you see the threefold temporal use there. The Septuagint makes it even smoother. So um, uh, both those uh, are used, and that's where you get the threefold use, the one who was and is and is coming. Okay. Um, another use. Assimilated use of the Old Testament. Now that's a use uh, where 
the biblical writers, perhaps like the Puritans in the 1600s in the United States, um, they're so saturated with Scripture that in their everyday language they can't help but uh, use biblical language. And um, so what this would be, Old Testament language has become merely part of the author's own vocabulary. Um, so for example, the phrase in Revelation 5.12, where God is being glorified, where it says, power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing, which, which Handel is quoting in the Messiah. That's Revelation 5.12. Probably this was liturgical language that was just part of the warp and woof, the way uh, that they express themselves liturgically. It probably, if it has an origin, it comes out of Daniel 4.30 of Theodosian, where it talks about God and it says, By the might of my power, for the honor of my glory. So you got four of the, what is it, six words, four of the seven. But this probably became, you know, just assimilated language, maybe with echoes of some passages like Daniel 4.30. Uh, this, by the way, this use comes close to the stock and trade use. So sometimes it might be hard to discern these two. Um, now, Another use, the last use, is the ironic or inverted use of the Old Testament. It's possible. We could put Psalm 2 here uh, as it's used in Revelation chapter 2 uh, that we just looked at. But at the very least, um, we can uh, talk about a text such as Galatians. Remember Galatians chapter 3 where... Uh, Paul speaks of Christ's death. He says, chapter 3, verse 10, he's quoting Deuteronomy 27, 26, For as many as are of the works of the law, they are under a curse. For it is written, Curses is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law or perform them. Um, and so, he goes on and um, says in verse 13, quoting Deuteronomy 21-23, Cursed is every one who hangs on a tree. And then it says, In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So, this text in Deuteronomy 21 was the most heinous punishment that could come upon an Israelite. It's terrible. It was for rapists, murderers, and so on. It's now applied to Christ. That's outrageous. In fact, Marcion, who hated the Old Testament, he produced a number of contradictions. He said, this is one of them. Deuteronomy 21 says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And how can they apply, it, apply that to the Messiah in the New Testament? There's a, there's a contradiction. The Old Testament must be wrong because Jesus is the most honored person. Um, well, point of fact, you've got to keep in mind, this was a punishment for the worst, like you and me. And Jesus had to go through it. So the ironic use of the Old Testament has saved us. He suffered for us. He suffered the most heinous punishment for you, for me. Likewise, um, some other text as well. Um, for example, Romans 5.14. I'll just quote that for you, where it says that Adam was a tupos, a type of him who was to come. How can that be? How could Adam, in Romans 5.14, the worst person that ever lived, we could put it that way, his oh, disobedient act and his condemnation is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ? Yeah. It's an antithetical type or an ironic type. It's a mirror type. That disobedience and condemnation was a foresh that was representative. That's the common element. 
foreshadowed a representative act of obedience and of consequent righteousness as a blessing. I think even Babylon Pentecost, I don't have time to prove it exegetically, but I think Babylon Pentecost are types. In judgment, God spreads the nations by tongues. At Pentecost, he brings them together by tongues. And there are, uh, I think, allusions too. Um, actual allusions in Acts chapter 2 to the narrative about the Tower of Babel. So it's very interesting. Um, so, now in all of these uses that we have talked about, the broad Old Testament context is always crucial. It's always crucial in my opinion, except for the rhetorical use, one understanding of the rhetorical use, where people like Christopher Stanley say, no, that uh, it's just used to persuade people to impress them with your authority. Um, now, I want to make sure that you note on pages 35 to 37 of my handbook, that gives you places to find allusions. The first place to begin with is your Nessel Alon 28 text. But there are others. I think you should also have, if you can afford it, the United Bible Society's a most recent, I think, fourth edition. And, um, and then there's some other tools there that can help you find allusions from the Old Testament in the New. Um, so, in Old and the New Studies, there's just a perennial debate about uh, whether the Old Testament in the New is used contextually in line with the original meaning of the Old or whether it's not used in line. And that's not just an outhouse argument between so-called evangelicals and non-evangelicals. That is a debate between evangelicals and not just evangelicals. Like I said last time, that is a debate between Reformed evangelicals and not just between Reformed evangelicals. That's a debate between Westminster Theological Seminary Reformed evangelicals. But I'll qualify that. It used to be. It used to be a debate. It is no more. So, um, now I just want to, uh, we'll take a two-minute break, and uh, we're going to switch to uh, a new lecture. Okay. Just a two-minute break. Okay, I think it's time uh, to get going. Uh, this this uh, lecture is, is titled uh, Summary Overview of the Presuppositions of the Apostles' Exegetical Method. So, uh, we, we can say it this way. Uh, summary. Summary of the Presuppositions of the Apostles' Exegetical Method. We like to use that phrase, presuppositions, here at Westminster. And... Um, what is a presupposition, by the way? How would you define, anybody wanted to define a presupposition? I know I have a couple of people in my hermeneutics class where we just define the presupposition. Anybody want to define a presupposition? We talk so much about it here, we usually don't really define it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the organization of facts about something that give that something meaning. And what, so there's a framework that organizes. Okay, so for example, we believe in the supernatural and in God, and so we understand trees and flowers as God created things. Those are our presuppositions. We organize, we understand reality in the light of that. An atheist understands uh, trees in a different way. They're accidentally produced trees. They're different objects, they're different facts, ultimately. Um, so a presupposition is uh, a lens through which you see everything that, that, that uh, colors everything you see. So it's a green lens, let's say, so that you see everything in green. Um, I think there are bad lenses that lead you astray. Uh, some would say because we all have presuppositional lenses that um, when we read a, a text like the Bible, we cannot understand what it originally meant because our lenses color the text and distort it. But I believe that there are presuppositional lenses that lead into the truth. Someone said that something like the truth will make you free. 
And uh, I think he was talking about presuppositional lenses. Uh, Matthew 6, 22 to 23 says, if your light is, if your eye is dark, you're going to see darkness. But if it's light, you'll see light. He's talking about presuppositional lenses there. And so the, the apostles had lenses through which they understood the Old Testament. And if we don't understand those lenses, we're not going to understand the connection of the Testaments as well. And so that's the purpose of this lecture. What were those presuppositional lenses? And uh, I want to begin with, um, I'll, I'll give a broad outline here. here. This is the broad outline for the lecture, very broad. We're going to begin with challenges to the contextual use of the old and the new. Remember, I just finished with there's a debate that some don't think the New Testament uh, 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 develops the old in line with its original meaning, and some do, and there's a debate, and that's not just an evangelical debate. It's also a debate among Reformed um, interpreters. And uh, so let, let's, let's talk about that. And, and usually this discussion is brought up in the context of how Judaism uses the Old Testament. And there's assumption that Judaism uses the Old Testament not in line with its original meaning. Well, sometimes they did, but they often were just wild and crazy. And uh, in, in the New Testament, we've got to in, understand the New Testament in its environment, including its hermeneutical environment. And so, since they were really a Jewish sect at the beginning, they also must have used the Old Testament, like the rest of Judaism. They were raised that way. And that, that is one argument, um, a very widely held position uh, that the New Testament authors uh, was just like their Jewish environment and wild and crazy hermeneutic, hermeneutically, yet we're assured by some who hold that view that they were guided in their interpretation by Christ. So Christ used the Old Testament likewise in an illegitimate way. But then we're told that that's okay for evangelicals because they were under inspiration. Method is not so key, it's a conclusion. So they preached the right doctrine, Jesus and the apostles did, but from the wrong text. But they were inspired. They were inspired. We can't do that. Okay? Now, there are some who says that we should follow them in that, intriguingly. Um, which is, in my view, very weird. Um, so, we're told that we cannot imitate their methods, but their conclusions are right. We can believe their doctrine. And I want to raise some questions about that. First of all, this assumption that Jewish interpreters were wild and crazy in the way they understood the Old Testament, I think that assumption has to be challenged. First of all, I have a friend who wrote a book. It's called Techniques and Assumptions in Jewish Exegesis Before 70 A.D. Techniques and Assumptions uh, in Jewish Exegesis Before 70 A.D. It's by a guy by the name of David Enstone Brewer. Brewer is the last name. And in that book, he said, he isolated through form criticism just a little iffy, but he did the best he could. Tried to isolate those rabbis that interpreted the Old Testament before 70 A.D. and, and differentiated uh, uh, those that, that were interpretations after 70. And he found that in every case, they may not have interpreted the Old Testament rightly, but they tried to. That they, they, they tried to use a good, they were trying to get at what the Old Testament author was saying. In fact, I wanted to show you the methods. This is listed by E. Earl Ellis in his book, uh, The Old Testament Early Christianity. Here are the, uh, the methods, Hillel's Rules of Interpretation. Very, very early. Every one of them, basically, are fine. Number one, the Jews would take a passage and draw an inference uh, from it and generalize it. Or they would take a passage that was very general and apply it to a specific instance. Or an inference drawn from an analogy of expressions. 
So they compare two Old Testament passages and draw a principle from it. Um, a general principle established on the basis of a teaching contained in one verse. And so on. All, all of these are just very logical and basic interpretative principles. They're not principles that, uh, like, like Origen laid out this whole allegorical system of how to interpret allegorically. And No, th this is not what this is. This, th th this characterized pre-70 AD. Again, if you want all of that, it's found in uh, E. Earl Ellis, the Old Testament in early Christianity. Uh, those are just, they're, they're about seven rules um, that he gives here. And um, so uh, I, I would question that early Judaism is as wild and crazy as people make it out to be. It doesn't mean they were always right at all. Furthermore, I have found myself and other scholars that when you actually exegete in Judaism and see what they're doing in their exegesis, there's a lot of good exegesis. In fact, I just showed you the Qumran War Scroll. That's pretty contextual understanding, isn't it? They had chapters 11 and 12 of Daniel, and that was their understanding of the final battle. They were interpreting contextually. And uh, in, in my book, uh, called The Use of Daniel in Jewish Apocalyptic, and in the Revelation of St. John, half of the book is just to show that they used the, the framework use of the Old Testament, the prototypical blueprint use of the Old Testament, which is, of course, that's very contextual. And the other half shows how John in the book of Revelation used it. Uh, another book, besides In Stone Brewers, is a, a book by a fellow by the name of Lars Hartman. Lars Hartman is not an evangelical he wrote a book called Prophecy Interpreted. And in that book, about half of his book does the same thing about Judaism that I do. It's very contextual. They, they modeled whole sections the Jewish apocalyptus did uh, on the Old Testament. And it, it, it's that area in Jewish apocalyptic where you think they would especially be wild and crazy. Because they're having these visions, or they think they are. And, um, but they're, they're, they're often... Um, very good. In fact, I had a student at Wheaton. We, had, we made our doctoral students take a course at another institution, so we took a course at the University of Chicago, studied under a rabbi in this course, and it was, uh, he, they were studying a midrash from about, I don't know, the end of the 200s AD, and um, <clears throat> so my student wrote a paper on it, and consistently the midrash, later midrash, this is after 70, when some people expect, oh, they really got wild and crazy, after uh, uh, 70 A.D., this is later 200, and this Midrashic interpreter was extremely consistent in interpreting the Old Testament. Uh, and he talked to the rabbi about it. He said, oh, yeah, sure. Uh-huh. Now, I talked to someone else who I have in one of my other classes who studied under a rabbi, and um, that rabbi... Uh, use the scriptures in a very atomistic and non-contextual way. So uh, I'm sure modern and ancient rabbis differ. And, and likewise, there's some uh, strange rabbinic exegesis early on. Um, I'm not saying it was all great before 70 AD either. But I'm saying it's an overcharacterization to say it was all wild and crazy. There was some good exegesis being done in Judaism. So much so that... New Testament exegetical method and Jewish exegetical method reflected one another. But this, this idea that's often uh, uh, proposed that the New Testament writers, you know, they're just part of their socially constructed culture. That's a phrase, you know, a good postmodern phrase or a bad one, however you view it. And uh, so the New Testament writers... Uh, they were socially constructed hermeneutically as well. So, of course, they're going to use the Old Testament in, in weird ways like Judaism. Well, I've already said I don't think Judaism was typically weird before 70 A.D. But furthermore, even if they were weird, even if we grant that, the New Testament writers had a unique hermeneutical perspective compared to Judaism that would have caused their exegesis to 
try to develop and indeed to develop the Old Testament in line with its original meaning. And that's what we want to look at. We want to look at uh, examples uh, of, of presuppositions. Before we do, I just want to make a brief comment about the typical passages that are used to um, uh, explain the New Testament writers were non-contextual. Uh, I want to put those on, on the overhead here. So they, they, they'll adduce these. They'll say, uh, you've got uh, ad hominem argumentation. Ad hominem means against the man. So, for example, let's say someone came in here and, and they disagreed with my view of the Old Testament. And they said, Bill, you, 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 you're just a shabbily dressed person. And you, you, your house is crummy looking. You can't, you, you must be wrong then in your understanding of the old and the new. So it's an argument against the man. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the topic. So you have these kind of arguments. Uh, uh, purportedly, uh, people like Richard Longenecker, these really come from Richard Longenecker. Uh, uh, some people think that the New Testament writers conducted their arguments that way. And the reason they did was to conduct a polemic against the Jews who were attacking them. And so uh, one non-contextual use of the old and the new is uh, Galatians 3.19, where it says that God revealed the law through angels. Nowhere in the Old Testament where it says that God revealed the law through angels. And so Longenecker says Paul is using this just to kind of battle with uh, the Jews in, in their own tradition. Uh, or maybe he actually believed it. Um, in fact, I really don't have a problem with it because Deuteronomy 33, I think, supports the notion that the law was revealed through angels. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2 says, The Lord came from Sinai, dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At His right hand there was a fiery law. So He's coming, He's in the midst of angels, and He's giving that fiery law at Sinai. So there's a close association there. The Septuagint. Listen to what they do. At his right hand, there were angels. That's amazing. So the Hebrew says at his right hand was a fiery law. Septuagint says they were angels. Angels were, were at his right hand to giving that law. I think it's a good interpretation on the part of the Septuagint. And I think, and I think it's deduced from embedded, implied in the Hebrew text. So, uh, but this is a text. This is what I call... All of these passages, both by non-evangelicals and some evangelicals like Richard Longenecker and others, they'll take these texts and they'll just say these are examples of errors, wrong use of the old and the new. And they just leave it at that. They don't investigate anymore. And I'm finding some of the best work done in old and the new today at our major universities that are not evangelical is done by evangelicals who hold a high view of Scripture. And they're saying, you know what? I'm not going to go with the traditional guild's interpretation that these are wrong uses. Maybe they're right uses. And I, I can, uh, I have one person in my mind right now who uh, did that with a, uh, one, one of these passages and uh, convinced his supervisor at the University of Cambridge that uh, she was wrong um, in the interpretation of this particular passage and that he was right. She, he, he convinced her. Uh, so inspiration of Scripture is a good view because it causes us to say, oh, I'm going to continue to search for that answer. Now, it would be fundamentalism just to say, oh, no problem. Um, you know, it's, it's probably true. I don't know how, but probably true. Just keep investigating. And if we can't find the answer, then we leave it in tension. But um, the liberal fundamentalists, this has become fundamentalism to them. They don't investigate anymore. They just say, wrong, never look at it, never investigate it again. Just because some great scholar said it, they follow the great scholar, whether it's Rudolf Bultmann 
or whoever. Um, so uh, let's look at a few others here. Um, I'm not going to mention all of these, but every one of these uh, in my footnotes in the handbook, and by the way, um, this, uh, this comes out of, let's see, I thought I had the pages there of what that came out of. Let me see. Get my, uh, pay, it might be page, is it page two? Let me see. I had the, I don't know where my handbook went. I had my handbook here. Hmm. Is it page two? Okay, fine. Um, so you'll find the footnotes to page two, apparently, that uh, there are articles showing how these are contextual uses of the old and the new. Um, with regard to allegorical interpretations, uh, Deuteronomy 25.4, 1 Corinthians 9.9, 9, that's just an analogy. We went over that. So every one of these are contested, uh, but they're often adduced as erroneous uses of the old in the new. Um, so, um, I want to talk about then the contribution of C.H. Dodd. C.H. Dodd was not evangelical. He held the Lady Margaret chair at the University of Cambridge in the uh, 50s and 60s. Um, perhaps on into the early 70s, and a uh, very famous New Testament scholar. He wrote a little book called According to Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. And in that book, he said that... Um, he, was, he was arguing against a guy named Rendell Harris, who said the New Testament writers, whenever they quote, they're quoting from an apologetic list of testimonia, and they're, they're not quoting from the actual literary context of the Old Testament books. <clears throat> so they're really using these things out of context. Dodd was reacting against that. And that, that, that view was presented by Rendell Harris in the early 1920s. <clears throat> and so Dodd comes along. It was a very popular view. Dodd says, you know what? He says, I'm, I'm finding that those passages... Uh, <clears throat> actually uh, come from uh, the context. So that when an author quotes or alludes, Dodd said, you can tell that they're alluding or quoting in the light of the broader context. <clears throat> how, how did he try to demonstrate that? Well, uh, here, here's how. He said that uh, th th there was a particular phenomenon he saw. He saw that usually New Testament writers don't quote <clears throat> and allude to the same passages. Now, there are times that they do that, like Jesus uh, quotes Isaiah 6, 10, 9 through 10, three times. And then it's quoted again at the end of Acts. <clears throat> you do have it. Psalm 110 is quoted quite a lot. It does occur occasionally. Psalm 110.1. So this repetition occurs occasionally, but it's rare. He says, but what you do find is a repetition of contexts that authors are quoting at, out particular verses from whole contexts. And uh, he began to discern those contexts. And so he said the very fact that they're quoting particular verses, not the same ones, but from the same broad context, it shows that probably they had an awareness. They were taught these broad contexts by Jesus, and that's why they would quote and allude from those contexts. Let me, let me give you a few of those contexts. <clears throat> Let's see here. For example... I'm going to put this down. <clears throat> Hebrews 
Here are the contexts that he saw that the New Testament writers quoted from. Uh, well, Psalm 2, 7. But actually, we could just say Psalm 2 because there are other passages. Uh, verse 7 is only one of them. Psalm 8, 4 to 6. Now, Psalm 110 is a verse repeated continually. Um, <clears throat> so is Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. Um, but, uh, let me come back here. Yeah. Notice here, Isaiah 40 to 66. That was a huge text plot that they quoted from. Uh, they wouldn't quote the same verses, but they quote out of it. Daniel 7 through 12, Genesis 12 to 22, Genesis 1 to 3, Deuteronomy 28 to 32. And these up here are some of the particular verses that were quoted. But these especially are the, are the major uh, text blocks that they quote from. So he says all of this pointed to an awareness of context, not merely an awareness of single verses, an awareness of a whole verse by alluding to part of the verse and not the whole verse. So sometimes just a part of a verse would be cited. <clears throat> now, uh, again, uh, God was not an evangelical. And, um, and, and he, he came up with this view. Not everybody has agreed with the view, but a lot of people have agreed with him. And um, so... So let's, let's actually look at the presuppositions that the New Testament writers had. Dodd doesn't really talk about these presuppositions uh, very much. Um, <clears throat> but when, when, once you, you, you look at Dodd's work, it doesn't mean that uh, a New Testament writer is necessarily... Uh, uh, aware of everything in the context. There may be a semi-contextual awareness. Uh, there may be a spectrum upon which uh, uh, of awareness that we could talk about. And remember there are ironical uses of the Old Testament where at the first glance it looks like the New Testament writer has uh, uh, turned the Old Testament text on its head. He's quoting it in an opposite way that it should have been understood. But there's an ironic intention in that. So that's very, very important to realize. So, num Roman numeral three then are the distinctive uh, presuppositions that they had, and it's these that really help us understand why Dodd said what he did. He did not really talk much about these, these presuppositions, and <clears throat> most of these are uh, presuppositions that Judaism did not have, and it made the New Testament uh, different. So here is, uh, and I, I, have, I have all these presuppositions laid out, I think, in chapter 6. <clears throat> but here it is. Number one, that Christ is viewed as representing the true Israel of the old and true Israel of the church in the new. Well, that... that that's really the first full presupposition. Uh, underlaying that is the assumption of corporate solidarity or representation. Fathers represent families, kings represent nations, as prophets do, etc. Just as Adam represented humanity. So Christ is viewed as representing the true Israel of the old, true Israel of the new. Three, that history is unified by a wise and sovereign plan so that the earlier parts are designed to correspond and point to the latter parts. And four, that the age of end-time fulfillment has come in Christ. <clears throat> and as a consequence of four and five, the latter parts of biblical history function as the broader context to interpret the earlier parts because they all have the same ultimate divine author who inspires the various human authors. And one deduction from this premise is that Christ is the center of history is the key to interpreting the earlier portions of the Old Testament and its promises. Now, 
If you don't have these presuppositions, there's going to be a real problem. And let me tell you why. What happens when <coughs> you have a prophecy about Israel that is applied to a Gentile church? Uh, many would say, what could be more obviously non-contextual? A prophecy of Israel? Seems to fulfill in the church? Well, that, that's just wild. It's not, that is not properly contextual. And that's what dispensationalists would say, too. <clears throat> that's, what the, that's why they would say, well, these prophecies are compared to the church, but they're not fulfilled in the church. Because if they're fulfilled in the church, then this throws a wrench in Scripture because these were prophecies of Israel, not prophecies for the church. However, <clears throat> if the presupposition is true, that Christ is true Israel and that the church in union with him and represented by him is also true Israel, then they are hermeneutically, if you will, redemptive historically, legally true Israel. And it is proper to say that the Old Testament is fulfilled in them as they are in union with Jesus Christ. Or you may have these uh, statements that Scripture is fulfilled in an event. An event is quoted, and you look back, hey, that, that, out of Israel I've called my son, Hosea 11, 1, and Matthew says that Jesus coming out of Egypt fulfills that. I mean, good night. Uh, that's like Bible 101, an event is not a prophecy. But once you understand this, out of which typology grows, yeah, you can have events pointing forward. And if those two, you don't have that presupposition, there's going to be a lot of discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New. You're going to have a real time relating the Old and the New. Prophecies about Jesus, well, let's back up. Prophecies about the Messiah fulfilled in the church. How can that be? The church is a, uh, the many. It's, it's many. It's not one person. It's not the Messiah. How can you do that? That's hermeneutically wild. Well, right here. He represents them. They're in union with him. And prophecies about him can be seen as fulfilled in the church. So if we don't have these two presuppositions, we're going to be in big trouble. And both of them, by the way, I show in the chapter how they're supported biblically. These presuppositions are not just presuppositions that are, can be discerned in the New Testament. These are presuppositions rooted in the Old Testament's use of the Old Testament. So, um, these, are, these are very important, and uh, perhaps it's important, too, that I close on time. We're a couple of minutes over. We will come back. We'll go through the library, and then the fourth week, we will finish the introduction to uh, Old and the New, and then we will start having case studies of particular Old and the New passage to try to exhibit the method of Old and the New.